of architect at our discussion on learn gita live gita course this is the second chapter which we are reading krishna concept of infinity Okay, let's do an overview of chapter what we discussed. Mm-hmm. So we started with the basic question: How do we infer mm-hmm. the presence of God? How do we know mm-hmm. that God exists? And uh, we saw many many empirical evidences, uh, which like observations around us, which inspire us or which uh, um, provoke us that oh, they look out for something higher reality. Look out for presence of god so first of all identify you you are different from matter we discussed uh, how even great scientists they also are forced to uh, think in this direction that yes we are different from matter like the stars and uh, uh, planets and the rocks in the universe they do not uh, think or they do not create physics or they do not ask the questions uh, how the solar system is functioning how the uh, how everything is so precisely uh, tuned how everything is working as per some basic laws or they do not even think that they do not even hypothesize that there must be some underlying laws which are governing everything right so humans are very special so we saw perfect design and perfect uh, order and then we discussed law of karma and then we discussed also uh, divine revelation revelation by the seers of truth and then finally we have come to a concept of absolute truth so as we discussed the concept of absolute truth has been discussed uh, is being discussed uh, since time has been discussed since time immemorial right um, whenever intelligent people have uh, populated this world they have always asked the question about truth and those who are really intelligent they ask the question about what is stable truth what is permanent truth so what is absolute truth which is uh, bringing about all the other forms of truth like we discussed how the many scientists they say the underlying truths are these laws of physics they are <laughs> creating everything right and let us so they say let us try to find and formulate these laws of physics if we understand them perfectly then we know how the how everything is existing then we know the absolute truth right so there are absolute truths um, but we saw many many flaws in just considering laws of physics as absolute truths right um, we discussed that at length um we can do more discussion but <laughs> that as far as far as this course curriculum goes uh, we discussed many uh, interesting points okay uh, then we started discussing about the concept of absolute truth as given in vedanta so to understand that concept we first contemplated upon the mathematical concept of infinity that what is infinity so i gave you an example that people find it very difficult even scientists find it very difficult to consider uh, how can you keep adding something and still it is finite or, or still it is not overflowing right how you keep adding and still it does not overflow or and still it is a valid concept so that uh, is incomprehensible and we discussed in mathematics these concepts which are really uh, as cantor has said i can see it but i can't believe it right so this is the concept of infinity as per our mathematical understanding but this concept has been discussed in a uh, Uh, in a very uh, beautiful way in the vedanta in the philosophy of the vedas which means the upanishads bhagavad gita uh, and bhagavatam so they are the philosophical part of the vedas other vedas are primarily about karma kanda and about like you're doing different rituals uh, rituals means uh, how yagya agni hota yagya and so many different types of yagya vajpay yagya but uh, the philosophical part is there in the upanishads uh, and uh, is primarily there in the upanishads and in the 
Bhagavatam. So this is uh, this is what we read yesterday. Om Purna Madha Purna Midam Purna Purna Madhachate Purna Se Purna Madaya Purna Mevavashishate. So Purna Madha Krishna is perfect. Purna Midam this world is perfect or complete. Purna Purna Madhachate whatever comes from the complete is also complete. And Purna Se Purna Madaya when we take out a complete whole from the original complete whole then Purna Mevavashishate still that remains the complete whole. So Krishna remains still complete, the complete balance. So the, that is the concept of absolute truth given in uh, in the light of uh, infinity. Like how Krishna is so infinite and even if we, even if millions of uh, infinite number of universes are coming out from him and each universe is a complete whole but still that Krishna does not diminish. I think we discussed yesterday about different uh, uh, levels of infinity, right? So this is also a nice perspective that Krishna is the highest level of infinity. Even in the infinite, he is the highest, in topmost infinite. And every other infinity, like Krishna is saying, this world is also complete or infinite. So this is a subset of that infinity, or this is a, a lower infinity, if you want to put it that way. But what it means is, but still it is complete. As we discussed yesterday, you can study a single cell and still it is as elusive as ever. So you can't uh, say, yes, I have now understood everything about the cell. So people said it in the past uh, that we understand everything about molecules and chemicals and then Rutherford said, no, no, <laughs> there is a structure to it, there is a small nucleus and then further came so many other scientists and uh, Niels Bohr, he said, no, no, there is another structure, then Einstein, another structure and then further so many other scientists like Dirac, and others, they said, no, different structure, <laughs> Heisenberg, different structure. And so people are still doing PhD on the atom and still they're not able to find the, what is there inside that. And now they say they, have, they are building tunnels, right, you know, CERN uh, in Switzerland. Uh, so if there is a big tunnel, a uh, tunnel means it's, a, it's called a, uh, uh, accelerator, particle accelerator, where you can do experiments and try to see what is there inside the atom. <laughs> so people are trying to study the structure of atom and they are still spending millions and billions of dollars but still not able to uh, figure out. And now they say, oh we need more money <laughs> to be able to do more further experiments and then they say, who, will, who can give us this much money? <laughs> so they are <laughs> not able to find funders to fund their research. But the point is that the, even a cell or even a small atom is so elusive, like it is so uh, infinite <laughs> within uh, in itself uh, and we also discussed how information contained inside a single cell is enormous right? our whole body was there in a the, all the information of our body was there in this single cell just like uh, information of the complete tree uh, is there in the small seed so not just the tree but also how to uh, how to generate more trees like same seed will become a tree and give rise to further more seeds which will create more further seeds and trees. <laughs> so this is uh, really enormous. Okay, now, okay let's further read today. Uh, so now we are going to discuss about Krishna from Bhagavad Gita that how the concept of infinity or concept of the Krishna concept of infinity is given in the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so uh, F, uh, okay, so this is section number 2.8.3, Krishna, the original infinity. So let's start from here. Namam Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Peshthaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Atinamude, Namaste Sarasata Deve, Gaudabhani Pesarine, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi, Paschati Deshatarine, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadad, Rashi Vasadi Kaur Bhakti Vinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama. So this is, okay, Krishna is saying in Bhagavad Gita 7.7, so every sense of our infinite infinity concept is just the reflection of the original infinity Lord Shri Krishna. And he says so in Bhagavad Gita 7.7, Mataha parataram nanyat kinchid asti dhananjaya mai sarvamidam protam sutre mani ganaiva. He says, o, can, o conqueror of wealth, Dhananjaya means Arjuna, there is no truth superior to me. 
everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. So there is no truth superior to Krishna. And Krishna is the topmost infinity and there is no, nothing further above him. It means every, all information comes from him. All, everything comes from him. There is no, no truth superior. He is the absolute truth. He is like, uh, if you say, uh, the ultimate law of physics. <laughs> Uh, he is not just a law, it is, he is much more than a law, but if uh, scientists uh, want to find the, the most basic law, the most absolute law, then Krishna is that. And then Krishna says, like, what is a law or what is, okay, let us say in terms of physics, what is a law? Law is the basic underlying thread which is supporting everything, right? So somebody can say, okay, uh, electromagnetic, uh, Maxwell's equations are the basic thread which is supporting all phenomena, like we see light, it is because of Maxwell's equation. We see uh, our uh, heat somewhere, our sun is heating the earth, this is also Maxwell's equation. We see uh, magnetism, we see electric current, everything is governed by Maxwell's equation. So Maxwell's equation is the, uh, Maxwell's equations are the basic thread on which everything is supported. But is it so? No. <laughs> they don't explain so many things, right? They, they just explain a little bit about uh, electromagnetic radiation, but not much, not much. So, but uh, so this is, a, but this gives you an idea. What is the meaning of the underlying thread, the on which everything is resting? So Krishna is that underlying thread on which everything is resting. So basically, what is resting? So, for us, we can see all our experiences are resting on Krishna. You know, I'm able to see. I'm able to see, which means I'm able to have visual experience. So this is uh, resting upon Krishna. If Krishna withdraws the space, then Krishna withdraws uh, that uh, my ability to experience, which is, co which is coming because of the space, because of the senses, uh, and because of the uh, objects in the external world. So this, this will, uh, uh, th th if Krishna withdraws this, then there will be no experience for me. I will be not experiencing anything. So all my experiences are resting on Krishna. And then even my existence is resting on Krishna. Any faithful person who approaches Bhagavad Gita accepts Lord Sri Krishna as the absolute truth. He is the greatest. So Krishna is the greatest. How great is our Lord Krishna? So Gita says in point 2, Krishna himself says, Name vidu suraganaha prabhavam na maharshayaha Aham Adirhi Deva Nam Maharshi Nam Chasarvashaha. Krishna says, even the demigods, Suraganaha, the Suras, the demigods, even they cannot know me. <laughs> it's like, you can imagine, um, you will say, who knows, or, or all our actions are known to demigods, right? So, you know, uh, Chitragupta is noting down everything, Dharmaraj is making all decisions of our actions, so none of our action is hidden from Chitragupta or Dharmaraj or between Yamaraj. So nothing is hidden from him. Uh, when we do anything, it is watched by Pavan Dev who is everywhere around, by Vayu Dev, Agni Dev, Agni Dev is everywhere around, by Indra, by all these demigods, they watch all our actions. Nothing is hidden from them. Uh, but there is still, Krishna is saying, even they don't know Krishna. Even these people who know everything about me, even they do not know Krishna. So Sura, Sura Ganaha, the demigods are very powerful, but even they fail to understand Krishna. Okay, you can say, who is the supreme, uh, topmost demigod, or the, <laughs> the topmost demigod means the father of all the demigods, father of father of father, ultimate father of everybody. That is Brahmaji. And Brahmaji's whole body is made up of intelligence. Like my body is made up of uh, blood, flesh, things like that. But Brahmaji's whole body is made up of uh, intelligence. So uh, he he has a body made of intelligence. That is <laughs> really I, I have a I have got a very small brain. How much can I process? But Brahmaji's whole body is just not just um, not the gross brain, but very subtle intelligence. So whole body is made up of intelligence. So you can imagine how intelligent he must be. But even he is not able to know Krishna. Uh, perfectly. I mean, he, he does not know Krishna completely. He knows certain aspects of it and he is very happy with that. He is a great devotee of Krishna. He chants Sari Krishna all the time as we have been hearing from Sir recently in uh, that uh, about Haridas Thakur. Uh, so Brahmaji is, 
he knows uh, certain aspects of Krishna, he knows his relationship with Krishna, uh, but he does not, he cannot say, I know Krishna completely. Nobody can say, I know Krishna completely. Completely means exhaustively, right? Nobody can exhaustively know Krishna. But Krishna can still bewilder anybody. Brahmaji got bewildered, Lord Shiva gets bewildered, like so many times. So, thus Krishna is saying that nobody can understand him, but rather he is the source of everybody. He is the source of demigods and sages. So even Brahmaji, his source is Krishna. Right? Uh, you know, he is born from the lotus flower coming out from the navel of Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu is expansion of Krishna. Right? Okay, so because if you can understand God, okay, so this is a very simple logic. Now, there is uh, interspersing both uh, uh, our Shastra Praman, which means the uh, divine revelation with logic. So both are good, both are uh, helping us understand Krishna better. So the simple logic says, I think we discussed this point, if I understand something perfectly, then I can manipulate it, I can exploit it, I can use it for my own purpose, right? If I know an atom, if I know an atom, then I will be able to use it for my purpose. For example, laptop is made because people were able to manipulate atoms. People are able to manipulate electrons, that is why we have electricity, right? Once you understand something, they understood that electron has this property that whenever it flows through a, a conductor or resistor, it can do something interesting. It can either produce heat and light or it can produce magnetic field or it can like produce motion, which is because of electric field, so a magnetic field. So all these things are uh, known. Uh, that is why we are able to manipulate. So. If somebody understands Krishna perfectly, then he can manipulate Krishna also. And then he will become superior to Krishna. This is simple logic, right? Uh, so, that is uh, contradictory. Because then, this means that is, then that is not God. Means that then Krishna is not God. Somebody else is God who knows Krishna perfectly. So, it is common sense, it is simple logic that therefore, nobody can know Krishna perfectly. Nobody can know Krishna perfectly, by definition. So, so for, because... He is the source of everything. So this is another point. Krishna, nobody knows Krishna perfectly, but Krishna is the source of everybody. Which means, everybody is coming from Krishna. So if Brahmaji says, I am very intelligent, source is Krishna. Intelligence is coming from Krishna. And you know, whatever is there in the effect, it must be there in the source, right? We have discussed this point at length. If something is there in the effect, and it is not there in the source, that is not possible. Laws of physics will also not support it, in what to speak of transcendental uh, reality. So, if the demigods are coming from Krishna, this means whatever the demigods know, whatever demigods are capable of doing, whatever demigods can reach, Krishna already has it all. Right? Whatever the sages know, whatever the sages uh, are capable of doing, whatever is within the reach of the sages, Krishna everything, Krishna has everything, all that, because he is the source. So, this the two points, one is, nobody can know Krishna perfectly, another is, Krishna is the source of everything, and this is the concept of infinity. This is the concept, Krishna concept of infinity. So, what is concept of infinity, we, say, we said, so you say the number line, all numbers are coming from the number line, right? So the number line is the source of all the numbers. And the number line is infinite. So Krishna is the source of everything. And then, nobody knows Krishna perfectly. So, uh, the infinity is elusive. It is inconceivable. So this is the point. Inconceivability of Krishna. This is being made here. So absolute truth must be inconceivable. And absolute truth must be the source of everything. So two points. Absolute truth must be inconceivable and absolute truth must be the source of everything. This is the very basic understanding of absolute truth, right? So, anybody has any questions here? Because I think we have discussed very important point and if you understand this point, you will not be bewildered. This is very pertinent point. And the question is, are the demigods the master of different spaces? For example, Agni Dev is the master of fire space. 
Yes. Yes. They are the masters of different spaces and also different uh, phenomena. Okay. So they are masters because they are appointed by Krishna to do that task. Because you know Krishna is the source of everything. So this means Krishna is also the source of their authority. They have an authority. They have a power, administrative power. But Krishna is the source even of that. So that is the that, that is the meaning of absolute truth. So, okay. So what we are discussing is uh, the concept of absolute truth. Absolute truth must be inconceivable. Absolute truth must be source of everything. And then we are saying. Bhagavad Gita says, Isha Upanishad says, and so many Upanishads say that Krishna is that absolute truth. And so our this literature, it explains about Krishna in great depth uh, how, okay, so both things, okay. So Bhagavad Gita explains the concept of absolute truth and then how Krishna is the absolute truth. Both are uh, interspersed into each other. Both are immiscible. No, both are I- inseparable, sorry. <laughs> inseparable. Okay. Uh, so there is no bigger concept than that, than Krishna. He is the absolute truth. He further confirms this in Bhagavad Gita. Aham sarvasya prabhu mataha sarvam pravartate iti matva bhajan ke maam budha bhava samanvitaha. Krishna says, I am the source of uh, all the spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. So, okay, so these are two parts first. He is the source and everything comes from him. And then secondly, what is our role there? And the wise who know this perfectly, they engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. So if somebody has understood that Krishna is the original source and Krishna, everything comes from Krishna, then naturally he will become a devotee of Krishna. Iti matva bhajante maam. One, one who understands this perfectly, matva, they bhajante, they serve Krishna with all their hearts. Bhava samanvita, with all the bhava they serve. And they are buddha, they are perfectly wise, they are perfectly intelligent. Okay, so, so very nicely, uh, first we discussed Krishna concept of infinity and then we discussed our position in relation to that concept, in that, in relation to that absolute truth. So this is the definition of infinity. Here Krishna says, Aham Sarvasya Prabhu, means he is the ultimate source of everything that exists. And you can see in the figure that Krishna is as Mahavishnu, is lying in the Karanodak Sagar, Karanodak Ocean, and from every pore of his body, so see every pore, pore means the holes on our skin, every pore of our body, of Krishna's body, what comes out? A complete universe, like one seed of the universe. The universe comes out in a seed form, you know, seed becomes the tree, so similarly, this seed of the universe becomes the universe, and it grows to become uh, gigantic in size. Krishna says that he is the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Not just material worlds, but even the spiritual worlds come from Krishna. Everything emanates from him. Lord Krishna not only conceptualizes uh, each of these universes, but he alone supplies all ingredients and gives shape and structure to these universes. He is simultaneously the efficient cause in terms of conceptual structure and the purpose of this universe and causal principle of universal ingredients that make up this universe. So very nicely, okay. I think many, many, many concepts are being uh, discussed uh, very quickly. So let us go a little slowly here. Uh, so first is everything comes from Krishna. But how? So there are, to construct everything, you need two things. What is that? One is the design, the other is the ingredients. You need the recipe and the ingredients, right? So you, to cook something, you need the ingredients, and you also know the. You also want to. You also have to have the recipe. Uh, so the ingredients are called the uh, the uh, material cause. Uh, I think this term was used somewhere. Material cause and efficient cause. So material cause and efficient cause. Material cause means the material is provided, means the ingredients. Even they come from Krishna. And the next is efficient cause, which means the recipe. Even that is coming from Krishna. And then there is another kind of cause, which is called the final cause, which is the purpose. So what is the purpose of cooking food? The purpose is 
to satisfy our hunger, to satisfy our taste buds, right? There is a purpose. So whatever is being done, whatever is done, it has to have a purpose. That is called the final cause. So we discuss three causes. Uh, one is the material cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. The material cause is uh, the ingredients, uh, the efficient cause is the recipe, and the final cause is which is driving everything. If you don't want to cook, if you, if you don't want to eat, or if nobody wants to eat, why will you cook, right? So, so now let us study this in terms of uh, uh, Krishna conscious, in terms of Krishna's position. So, all the ingredients, Krishna is the source, right? Krishna is the source of all the ingredients needed for the universe. Then, Krishna is the source of the conceptual structure, the recipe. Uh, that is also coming from Krishna. And then the third, the, the purpose, the purpose of this entire existence is dash. Please answer. The purpose of entire existence is dash. The purpose of existence is dash. What is that? Somebody is writing to fulfill our desires. The purpose of existence is dash. To satisfy Krishna. Okay. Any other answer? Anybody else? The purpose of existence is dash. To understand Krishna. Okay, anybody else? Get Krishna Deva. Okay. <laughs> you are hearing self lectures. <laughs> Okay, good. Anybody else? Anybody else? Please don't hesitate. Uh, you can write anonymously, but I don't think that that is an option here. <laughs> okay, so nobody is writing. Let us discuss from the beginning. Um, I will start with Dheeraj Prabhu's answer to satisfy Krishna. Yes, so Krishna has uh, made everything. So there must be some purpose to it, right? And the purpose is uh, Krishna, Krishna's own satisfaction. And since we are also parts and parcels of Krishna, so we naturally get satisfaction when Krishna is satisfied. Just like the root is watered, then all the leaves and branches are automatically nourished. So uh, if Krishna is... Uh, satisfied, we naturally get satisfaction. And without that, if Krishna is not satisfied, then nothing can satisfy me. I may become billionaire and still I will cry. I may become professor at IITK, still I will cry. But if Krishna is satisfied, then whether I am a professor or a student, <laughs> I'll be happy. Uh, because Krishna is satisfied, then we are actually happy. And as Abhishek Prabhu said, to fulfill our desires, okay, so here we have to be a little cautious. These desires are not the mundane desires. Our present desires are all based on lust, greed, anger, pride, envy, illusion. So not to fulfill them, but our real desire, which is to serve Krishna. Okay. Then to understand Krishna, yes, Buddha Bhava Samanvita means uh, uh, you know, when you know Krishna, you naturally love him. So, so when we understand Krishna, we naturally appreciate Him, we naturally love Him. So the purpose of this whole creation is that we become more and more attached to Krishna and we cooperate Him in His, uh, uh, in his whole process. For example, I'll give you an example. So just like uh, if there is a marriage ceremony, then everybody is uh, doing everything for what? For satisfaction of, let's say, the bridegroom or the bride, right? So that they are very happy. So the parents will do all arrangements, the uh, brothers, sisters, the, all the family members, they are putting a lot of hard work 
to satisfy them and when they are happy and the marriage goes well everybody becomes happy right so uh, uh, but this is a very uh, occasional right marriage happens <laughs> uh, like once in lifetime and it is a uh, just for a day or just for a week or so right the ceremony is maybe just for a week and that is that is it so that there is no eternity to it it is very small and also it is not uh, guaranteed to be happy <laughs> to be a happy event but on the other hand krishna's uh, so if we serve krishna we naturally become happy uh, so uh, just like uh, krishna's um, so so the purpose of this creation everything has happened because krishna wants to do certain things krishna has his plans uh, to do i want to do this i want to do this today i will go here for grazing the cows tomorrow i will go there for grazing the cows day after tomorrow i will go there i will not go to graze cows but i will be at my home with my parents and like that krishna has different plans and god ram uh, says okay today i will go to uh, this place that place today i will go with mother sita to this vatika like that they have plans and we uh, assist them in krishna's uh, in we assist krishna in his happiness just like in a marriage party the everybody is assisting the bridegroom and bride uh, and they become happy with that but this is a mundane example because very selfish like right? in marriage who will become happy only the parents and the near and dear ones the other outsiders won't become happy but krishna is such that with we all have relationship with krishna that is why everybody becomes happy so next ashish was written to get krishna prema yes to get krishna prema uh, krishna prema means when we understand our relationship with krishna and we act upon that relationship that is uh, that relationship is the relationship of love um, so to get krishna prema means to uh, revive our intimate relationship with absolute truth with krishna as sinit was also mentioned uh, to establish a relationship with krishna so maybe you can say to reestablish because we already have a relationship but just that we have forgotten it to reestablish to reconnect with krishna this understanding makes us do devotional service yes very good so when we serve krishna we are trying to revive our relationship with krishna and when we our relationship is completely revived then we can do perfect service then we become perfect servants right so that is the uh that is the purpose of uh, existence okay uh good answers uh very nice answers now there is a question by abhishek prabhu he says how to define happiness i am never able to understand how to define it yeah very good question anybody wants to answer this question how to define happiness please answer how to define happiness how to define happiness somebody is answering temporary absence of sadness is happiness in this material world very good very good yes in this material world when we have some temporary absence of sadness we say we are happy <laughs> right so because this world is full of miseries this world is dukhalayam ashashvatam full of miseries so whenever there are there is slight relief from miseries then we say the world is happy for example now everybody is saying corona 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 and when they are saying when corona will be gone then we will be happy <laughs> right so which means they, this is the absence of sadness which they call as happiness um so yeah that is very true absence of sadness people consider as happiness okay. next might be when our senses get gratified with sense objects yeah when i get something desirable when my lust is satisfied not satisfied but it is temporarily uh, pampered <laughs> and then further it blazes more <laughs> okay so but when my uh, desires my uh, lusty desires are a uh, little bit pampered then i get uh i say that is my happiness in the material world okay yeah this is a very deep topic 
what is happiness uh, i can tell you my little bit limited understanding but if you want complete understanding then ask sir sir can give very good uh, understanding so ajit prabhu is telling a very very um, nice point which is very pertinent so scientists say that it is the dopamine rush in our brain which makes us happy <laughs> so some chemicals are released by some hormones some chemicals are released um, which uh, make which which we call as happiness so what is happiness it is the release of certain chemicals in our brain so okay <laughs> good good understanding <laughs> so we can we can uh, talk about this it's vice versa when we are happy dopamine is released okay <laughs> so uh, in the modern empirical science we can only know correlation we cannot know causal principle right correlation means we observe that we are happy and dopamine is being released right there is a strong correlation but what is causing what this we can never know even statistically we can never know <laughs> causality is something we cannot know so causality is a very deep concept even uh, philosophically what is the meaning of cause like krishna is saying here uh, i am the cause of everything sarva karana karanam <laughs> what is the meaning of cause this is a very deep concept but in modern science you can only know correlation okay we are happy and dopamine is being released what is causing what is not known so very good point which kind of puts our definition of happiness this definition of happiness under question is it really happiness or is it just an effect of happiness okay yes causality is not known here antidepressants use chemicals to remove sadness yeah actually antidepressants they mostly put you to sleep because they say these negative thoughts are coming because your mind is very active just suppress your mind and then uh, somehow <laughs> uh, you will get less depression because your mind will become so dull <laughs> you won't be able to think so because your mind is not thinking anything positive let us quieten the mind completely so that it is not thinking negative also so yeah i'm not an expert in uh, this area about uh, neurobiology but maybe chahat prabhu can enlighten us on this uh, if you know uh, okay let me come back to earlier definitions of happiness which you gave so happiness is okay, my understanding my limited understanding is that uh, we mm, so we have a desirable so we call something as desirable something as not desirable and whenever i get something desirable i say i am happy so my happiness is in getting something which is desirable so for example if i am hungry then the state of hunger it's uh, it's a different experience and i say this is not nice experience i don't like it why do i not like it i don't know but i just don't like it and when i am when i eat something when i am uh, when my stomach is hungry and i eat something then that state i call this is very desirable state why it is desirable i don't know but it is desirable so that is what i call happiness so when i eat something i become happy this is one very basic very simple understanding of happiness which i have uh, which means you have something which you assign as desirable and you assign as undesirable and when you get desirable you say i'm happy this is the material notion of happiness in the material world this is what happens because all this desirable and undesirable are are assigned by us so uh, so often uh, uh, i see it in terms of this example I, if i show you a picture this picture is what this picture is just combination of some pixels right rgb values in different locations it is just some combination of pixels i randomly choose some combination and show to you will you become happy or sad no because you cannot if i give you random uh, rgb values you won't suddenly start laughing or crying because you know you you don't have any preference or i like this is desirable or this is undesirable right but as soon as i give you a i i arrange those pixels in such a way that it's a picture of a uh, let's say um, a picture of uh, uh, ocean and uh, beautiful sunshine sunrise ocean and palm trees or coconut trees a nice beach so many of you will say oh this is very desirable i like this so you become happy 
And if I show you a picture of uh, Kanpur railway station <laughs> with all the... Now it is clean actually. Earlier it used to be very dirty. Uh, let's, let's say uh, outskirts of Kanpur railway station which is all uh, full of filth. Uh, and you will say, uh, oh, I don't like this. So you have an undesirable association. This is, uh, this is something undesirable. Uh, why it is undesirable? So, okay, what is the difference? If you look at the pixel level, no difference, right? So there will be same, his, uh, same proportion of uh, colors in both the images, right? This will be a black and white image, this will be a black and white image with same number of black and white pixels. But still, you like this, you don't like this. You have, this is desirable, this is not desirable. So what decides that? Mostly it is uh, just no reason. It's, it's our um, mental construct without any reason. So that is why it is said our happiness and uh, distress in this world is all illusory. But there is the concept of uh, happiness and distress uh, which is actually existing. The absolute concept of happiness and distress. So why do I know there must be something absolute concept of happiness and distress? Because uh, if something is there in the effect, it must be there in the cause. right? Because there is a natural tendency for me to assign desirability and undesirability and to seek desirable state and to uh, run away from undesirable state. This means this concept of uh, desirable and this concept of becoming happy when you get something desirable, it must be there in the absolute space also. So that is what uh, Krishna says in uh, the same Chatushloki. Krishna says, Machitta Madhgata Prana Bodhayanta Parasparam Kathyanta Shamam Nityam so Krishna says that um, when we discuss about Krishna, when we glorify him, when we uh, analyze him like in a very nice way, when we try to understand Krishna more and more deeply, uh, then we become really happy. So which, which means this is the most desirable state, means to be with Krishna, to spend time with Krishna, to uh, uh, study Krishna, I mean study means to analyze Krishna or to, uh, what do you say, to, to do Krishna Katha and then to serve Krishna. These are the desirable states which are desirable by our soul. Means these are our naturally desirable states. And when we get them, then we become actually happy. So this, uh, that is why it is all said, Raso Vaisaha, Krishna is the source of all happiness. So, and Sir was also discussing recently that, uh, like Bhakti Lata, it keeps growing and ultimately, un uh, until it gets the happiness of serving Krishna in, the, in one of the rasas. So, okay, the concept is, the, the, this concept of happiness is very deep and I think this was a very brief overview. This is my understanding and very limited understanding and I am sure if you ask to Sir, Sir will give you very deep uh, understanding. Okay, I think we can stop here because it's almost 8 o'clock. Uh, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. If you have questions, ask tomorrow. Hare Krishna.